Okay. Um, yes, uh, thank you for the introduction, uh, Paolo, and you already made a summary of uh, our talk because uh, <laughs> the title is a, a bit longer. I So that's the reason why I made a, I pop it up in, in certain stages. So this is a series of papers uh, and the end, the last member of a series of papers, um, the, the latest, I should say, not the last, uh, on passing um, for hyper-edge replacement graph grammars that we have been conducting over the last six or seven years. And today it's about top-down passing. The other one is bottom-up passing that will not be a topic here. And the new thing or relatively new thing, thing is that we define passes by uh, in a rule-based fashion. And this means by graph transformation rules in order to show their semantics in a clear fashion in order to be able to conduct proofs on, on this representation. So the new thing here is that we uh, consider contextual hyperedge replacement. Uh, hi, what's the problem? Okay, um, so contextual hyperedge replacement, which is a modest extension of hyperedge replacement grammars. And it turned out of passing that we have to stick to acyclic grammars. And all these things will be, of course, explained in the paper, in the talk. Uh, for a warm up, I, I considered to, to introduce a string passing to you, the corresponding top down string passing, and just implement it or specify it with graph transformation so that you see the the correspondence to the later parser in for graphs. And then we have to do some preparation in order to make the grammars fit to the parsing algorithm. And then the main core of the talk will be the non-deterministic top-down parsing uh, defined uh, by graph transformation rules and the usual conclusions, uh, you know, what this uh, will contain. Okay, let's warm up with spring a passing or string graph passing in this sense. And first of all, uh, just string graph grammars and context-free string graph grammars. And on the at the same time, I will also um, recall which kind of graphs and graph transformation we will be using in this paper. So um, string graphs are rather linear hypergraphs with only binary hyperedges. And they can easily represent uh, strings like uh, A, capital A, B, uh, in this fashion by just having, uh, by just connecting these uh, edges labeled A, A, and B uh, by, in a linear fashion. So this is the string graph um, idea, which is very old and used in many approaches. Then graph transformation, in this representation, uh, sorry, context-free uh, yeah, graph transformation we use is a dou double push out with injective occurrences of rules in host graphs. And the rules are quite standard. So we just uh, have left-hand side, right-hand side, and the uh, numbers here indicate the gluing points in the, in the particular graphs. And in later examples, we will also have uh, application conditions. So this is the graph transformation uh, mm, framework. And then we can use these string graph productions and the string graphs in order to do string graph derivation. And this is very clear that it, it mimics context-free string uh, derivations. Um, and yeah, so that's the first thing. And it's pretty clear uh, later it will be bit less obvious uh, what to do. And, and that's why it's nice to have a, a rather uh, simple approach to the to this problem. So what does a string parser do? It uses a stack automaton to parse uh, a language to construct a derivation for a word uh, that fits the input word. And so the stack automaton has configurations uh, they consist of a stack containing 
non-terminal string graph, meaning that there may be non-terminal symbols there, and an input graph that entirely consists of terminals, of course. And in a graph representation, they are just two string graphs uh, above, uh, to on top of each other, and in to the, I indicate the border between these by just this line. This is just decoration to ease the reading. And so uh, passing is based on two types of um, rules um, or actions or whatever you call them. Um, one is uh, expansion for the productions of the grammar. And this looks very much like the generating directions of the grammar, but it's not quite so because uh, we must be sure that the rules are applied only to the top of the stack and therefore the first node of the left-hand side is not a gluing node. So it, this rule applies only, here it applies not because this is a non-terminal, but it would only apply to the first uh, stack node, uh, stack edge of a, of a configuration. So the second operation is match, and there uh, a terminal to ter a terminal on the stack is matched with a, uh, an equal terminal on the in on the input, and both must be on uh, the first symbols in input and stack, and then it is matched, and this means just removing it because, it, so to speak, the work has been done. Let's remove it. Okay, uh, then we can um, tie this parser to the, these rules to configurations. We start with an initial uh, configuration where the uh, stack contains just the start symbol of the grammar, and then we end up with a configuration where the stack is empty and the uh, input graph is also empty, indicated by just the uh, the isolated nodes. Okay, um, this parser is not deterministic. It's inefficient because it has to backtrack. Expansions uh, can be is are non-deterministic. Every of these expansion applies to a corresponding graph configuration as here. You can make it deterministic by look ahead and adding conditions, saying that this could only be could only be expanded under certain uh, conditions of the input of the first symbols of the input, but I won't, won't go into these details here because I don't have time. But th this idea is also used in our passing technique later. Okay. Um, ah, sorry, I forgot. Termination is also given for this set of graph transformation rules. Um, whenever the productions of the grammar are not left recursive, meaning that there are no productions where the capital A appears on the left uh, as a first symbol of, on the left. Okay, so it's still here, but I will just uh, go over it. Um, now, the next step is to, to prepare um, the, our grammars for passing, and first, of course, I have to recall at least the, which kind of grammars we are passing. And the basis is context-free hyperedge replacement, where you know the rules for uh, from the string graph case already. Only here, the non-terminals have may have any arity. In our case, we define just trees with the context-free part, and later links with the context contextual part. Uh, the non-terminals are just uh, unary, and they generate uh, n-array trees. And we have extended this by another type of, pro uh, um, of productions, where the left-hand side may contain an isolated context node, as we call it, the node Y in this example. And by applying such a production, we can connect the X of the left-hand side to some node in the context of the host graph. And this is rather simple, but rather powerful with respect to generative power of, uh, of these kind of grammars. And with these 
uh, grammars we can define a linked tree uh, in this fashion. First, we apply context-free rules in this case. And as the last step, we have a contextual uh, application. And here we see that um, we apply it to this node, this is X. Uh, we apply this uh, contextual production. And in this case, we chose this node for as a context node and obtain this one. We could also choose this one and would obtain another graph. Okay, so now what do, do we have to do in order to transfer the ideas of string parsing to graph parsing? And just to recall, I, I repeat some of the configuration step and, and steps on configurations in the string graph case. So there are essentially two things to be done. First of all, we have to come up with an order of the graphs that are put on the stack. And in our case, it's the edges that are ordered. And for instance, uh, an, a graph like this can be ordered by just assigning numbers to the edges. But in the graph representation, we do it in a different way. We just have extra tentacles for these uh, edges and um, they are connected. These extra tentacles are connected in such a way that they form a linear um, uh, thread. And so to speak, they are both, they have a, a graph aspect and a string aspect in this way. So this is the first step. The second one is that as the string parser, we have to process edges from left to right. And there we have a, a little problem, at least if it comes to contextual hyper-edge replacement, because this cannot be always be done for reasons to be explained later. And so the main idea is to, um, to transform the productions, the contextual productions into context-free ones that borrow context nodes uh, that are then later created. Okay, so this is, we'll, we will discuss on the next slide and the dependency issue we will discuss on the over next slide. Um, yeah, borrowing hyper-edge replacement, and we need another operation that is called contraction also to be explained in a minute. So we take as a basis the context well productions of a grammar. In this case, we have just one. And we the borrowing production is freed of the contextual node. This is removed from the left-hand side, but not from the right-hand side. And as a second step, and this is just auxiliary stuff, we distinguish this node as a borrowed node by the double circles. And we also indicate which nodes of the left, right hand side should not be identified with this node, uh, this borrowed node. And in this case, it's the node X, because otherwise uh, this would not correspond to a, an application of the rule above. We, we cannot identify these in, in, in contextual hyper replacement. Okay, so this is the first thing. And if you are, uh, yeah, you may be uh, worried because this production will not construct the same graphs, not create the same graphs as the original one. And so we need another operation that is more or less independent of the other, and it's called contraction. And let's see uh, what, so it, it, what it does is to take a borrowed node and identify it with another one. And also to remove the auxiliary edges concerning separation and borrowing. So let's see the derivation here. So we have a, a graph, we apply the borrowed production and receive not a linked tree, but a tree with uh, another curly, um, edge. And now contraction allows us to identify this borrowed node with any other node of the graph that is not indicated as being as, uh, as separate. And in this case, there are two, uh, two of these nodes uh, yielding this graph and or this graph. So in this case, uh, our grammar is uh, a good one where every contraction of such a borrowed uh, a graph obtained by the borrowed uh, grammar is actually also be 
uh, can also be generated by the original contextual grammar. But this is not always the case, unfortunately, because contraction may yield incorrect graphs. And we have to deal with this, and we do this on the next slide. Uh, the problem is, or the, the phenomena, the phenomenon is uh, dependencies in, in, in these grammars. And uh, or as a basis, every grammar, also a context-free one, a hyper replacement grammar, has productions of um, between the graphs generated by productions. If E and F are generated by a production, these graphs depend, or these productions depend on the uh, on the on the other production that in created the left hand side of these productions. So just a matter of uh, creating non terminals and using non terminals. But in a contextual grammar, we also have another kind of dependency, namely between a contextual node that is yeah that shall be identified in the context and the node in the context where it is created. And so we get a red dependency between F and E. So F depends on E because the context node of F is yeah, matched with the created node of, of E. And unfortunately, or yeah, that's a, a collateral damage maybe, the po uh, borrowing productions just ignore these node dependencies. They just borrow the nodes and say, okay, contraction will cope with this later. But unfortunately, uh, contraction may then cause, in, in special cases, cyclic dependencies. And for these cyclic dependencies, we can find, cannot find an order in the original contextual grammar to, to produce the, uh, these particular uses of uh, contextual nodes. So for instance, one, uh, one situation would be Production B depends on A, and A has a context node and shall be uh, shall be identified with the node a node created by B. And this can never happen because we the contextual grammar needs this this node the this node before it can generate uh, the the graph B. And another dependency may occur, and this is um, if two Contextual productions C and D depend mutually on each other. So the, the contextual node of one production uses a, a, a node created by the other. And this also leads to cycles. And um, in our paper, we did not tackle the problem of precisely defining which kind of grammars um, have cycles, but we come up with a sufficient condition, which is relatively easy to check based on a grammar graph. And such a grammar graph, you see it here, uh, it contains production names, uh, non-terminal edges, edge labels, S and T, and node labels. In this case, it's the uh, because the nodes are unlabeled, it's just the this funny uh, symbol. And then for every production, the left-hand side label points to the production and the node labels or edge labels on the right-hand side uh, are successes of this production. And now the rule says uh, the grammar is acyclic. If there's no cy cycle in this grammar graph, that contains a node label. And since the only node label is this one, uh, this grammar graph is acyclic, even if it has a cycle between non-terminal edge labels and productions. Okay. And if we have acyclicity, um, then we can have the, this correctness uh, theorem that uh, we have a borrowing uh, HR grammar uh, at gamma of a, a contextual grammar gamma uh, and gamma is acyclic, then we have a derivation with the borrowing grammar and a subsequent con uh, contraction if and only if 
we have a derivation in the original contextual grammar. Okay, so this now we have restricted ourselves to acyclic um, borrowing uh, uh, high patch replacement grammars, and these can be used directly to pass. Okay, and again, uh, as for the spring case or the spring graph case, we have to first look oh, what are our configurations. Of course, we also have to, um, in some way, to represent a stack automaton, only that the stack automaton um, works on graphs rather than on, uh, on words. And so the configurations are defined as follows. We have a stack uh, that is a threaded graph. So the edges of these graph are linearly ordered. Then we have an input graph that is not ordered. Um, and additionally, we have an auxiliary edge, edges, uh, dashed edges that indicate correspondences between bindings between nodes of the stack to the input. <clears throat> Then we also have to identify which are the, ident the initial configurations, and they are just um, they just contain a stack that is the threaded version of the start graph and the input graph. And there is a special thing that we have to indicate whether a node has already been matched or not. And if it's not, it, if it's unmatched, it's depicted as such a uh, crossed out circle. And you see it also here, some of the nodes are crossed out. So typically bound nodes are not crossed out so that they have been matched. And also some nodes on the stack will be crossed out. That means they are not bound yet. Okay, so the um, except that, 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 yeah. that, uh, You should try to finish in five minutes or so. Yeah, yeah, okay, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure I'll manage, yes. Um, so the accepting configuration uh, has an empty stack, just the, the lonely thread node over there, and is the input is discrete, so just consists of nodes, and no node of input is uh, unmatched. Now you may wonder, because there are gray things around, and these have just been left in the picture of this configuration in order to show the history of the path. So in the actual definition, they are not present. It's just to show that there are certain relations and that these relations are well formed. For instance, you see that um, this here is a borrowed, is a graph derived by the borrowed um, grammar and the dashed arrows, they indicate a contraction of this uh, borrowed graph. Yes, and successful passes, yes, transform initial to second con configuration, that's clear. Um, so now how the, do the productions look like? Um, like in the string case, the, um, the expansion just consists of the production, the borrowing production uh, rules, but with the, uh, with the additional thread nodes and tentacles. Um, the match uh, also uh, is quite similar, but a bit more general. So for instance, here we have an, the stack contains an edge and we distinguish, we have to distinguish whether the attached nodes of these edges have been bound or ha are, have not been bound. And in the latter case, they have a corresponding node in the input. And then if there are, exists corresponding edges like this, then they are removed and the binding is preserved because K, for instance, can be referenced by other stack elements. For the, um, and of course we need in general several of these match rules depending on which node of, a, of an edge is already bound or not. And also a match rule is non-deterministic in that the host graph may contain many edges um, matching this pattern here. For borrowed nodes, we need a, a bit more care or more consideration. So for instance, here we have this borrowed edge and we want to match it. And the second node is 
not matched yet and is borrowed. And in this case, we can apply this even if the node in the input graph has already been matched because this link that the match here inserts will correspond to a contraction. So to, and this is okay. If this uh, condition is met, namely that the, um, the node matched here has to uh, is not a node that has to be kept separate and is bound by another node in in previous actions. Okay, so the main result, uh, not surprising, is correctness of this uh, set of rules. So there is a successful pass for an input graph G, like here, if and only if G can be generated with the uh, contextual grammar. So, and we have also a result concerning termination. Uh, and again, we require that the rules are not left recursive. Okay, this is a whole uh, derivation. I don't want to go into details of this. I don't have time. Uh, I don't also have time to talk on pre predictiveness because this is also not really new work done, it's more or less, the, it has been uh, described in other papers. So we see our modus operandi in all this work on parsing is first to steal ideas from string parsing as much as possible and lift them to the graph case. And the, an important uh, aspect in there is to disguise graphs as strings or to make them yeah, both strings and graphs by threading them. And also in, in the case of contextual grammars, we have to disguise them as hyper edge replacement grammars and do this borrowing business and uh, subsequent contraction. Yeah, related work on passing HR grammars because CHR uh, grammars are not that popular, uh, are often based on Clemens Lautermann's work who came up with a cubic parser. Um, several years ago, several decades ago. And now this has been used in several applications of natural language processing. And recently, more recently, a linear parser for regular HR grammars has been uh, invented. And we do not really know how the, this relate to the grammar class that, can we, that we can uh, process. Okay, so future work, and that's the last slide, Paolo. Um, some open questions remain with our work, and in particular with this paper. Um, can icyclicity uh, of dependencies be characterized? So is there a necessary and sufficient condition? We conjecture yes, but there is no proof yet. Uh, can DAGs, the uh, directly acyclic graphs, be generated with acyclic uh, contextual grammars? We conjecture no, but there is no proof yet. If this would be the case, if they could not be uh, generated, then the class of acyclic contextual grammars is uh, strictly included in the other in the general class. Um, furthermore, we want to do this rule-based passing also for P for predictive shift reduced passing the bottom-up uh, method in order to study the relation between the two with respect to generative power and so on. Okay, this is, I, I won't explain this, and but finally there must be a, an advertisement for Mark's uh, pa, uh, parser distiller. It's called Grappa, very nice name. And um, yeah, it is available and can be easily used to test all our algorithms, um, PTD or PSR. Okay, thank you for your attention and sorry for overtaking a bit. <laughs>